we have to become. We we we're not. It's not we are. It's not we are. We become, and we become through trial and error. We become through losses. We become through falling out of trees. You know, playing with one another. You know, wrestling in the front yard. Uh, kill the man with the ball. You know, doing the little punching each other's arm to see, you know, who can take it. I mean, these things are very barbaric, but for whatever reason, they've been around in society since the beginning of mankind and they work, you know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, we don't, we don't want to, we don't want violence. It's like, how is a young man going to grow up to be a man who provides and protects for his family if he's never gotten into a fight, if he's never had to defend anything, if he's never had to be challenged, pushed to the edge, and tested in, in, in the waters that are that are deep and uncharted. So participation trophies um, stunt growth. Uh, it creates entitlement. It demolishes delayed gratification, which everyone needs. So if you're rewarded for failure, what does that cause? That causes you to go into your job, your first job, and demand like a salary of like a senior VP, and you just got there. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to another episode of the Disrupt the Everyday Today, we're joined by Ahmad Vital. Ahmad, thanks for joining us today. Thank you all for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you on. Now, we're going to take this opportunity to get to know you to uh, to begin the show. So we're going to ask the loaded question, who is Ahmad Vital? Man, it, it, I think that would depend on who you ask. But <laughs> since, you're asking, <laughs> since you're asking me, uh, man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm a young man from a small town in Texas called New Caney who uh, started walking and put a pen in his hand by the time he was, uh, by the time he was eight years old, you know, wrote my first book at 10. Uh, always in, at the core, I always consider myself a writer. You know, you look through my bio and it's like 19 different titles I have, but at the core till, till I leave this earth, I'm going to have a pen in my hand and I'm a writer. And so um, I, I consider that uh, something that, that has been very strong and very, very much part of my life. And of course, it's leveraged into many things. I went to school for it. I was in, I'm coming out of high school for it. And I've really continued that my entire time, even all the way up to three books. Obviously, I've gone into speaking, consulting and all those things. But if we had to just keep it simple, which I like to do, is that at the core, I'm just a young man with a pen in his hand, a writer, and who had a dream from a small town in Texas. So here we are. All right. So a lot, yeah, a lot to unpack there. So the first thing you mentioned was you wrote your first book when you were 10. Yeah. Yes, uh, un unpublished book. It's unofficial. It, it'll never be never be logged as a book I wrote. But <laughs> we had a contest when I was in uh when I was in elementary school, and I wrote a book about things that I was bothered by when I was a youth, and it was called The Boogeyman. And I um, I wrote a book about the Boogeyman, and I, I was putting together a whole series. And my teacher's like, "This is amazing," and I was like, "Ah, don't worry about it." And I never did anything with it. But my first official book was at the age of thirty three. So, but the the but the ten but me writing uh, started at a very young age, 10. I was writing for I was writing for newspapers by the time I was 14 years old. So uh, it was a beautiful thing. And, you know, again, I'm still a guy with a pen in my hand. I actually have a pen in my hand while we're doing this podcast. So um, <laughs> I enjoy that more than anything. So that's where we started. And also, if I understand correctly, you also came up being involved with athletics as well. I did. Um, so in media, sports was one of the four, first things I jumped into, actually coming out of high school as well. Um, carried on and majored in journalism at Stephen F. Austin State University. My first job out of school, worked for a community newspaper covering sports and news for a, a town in northwest Houston area. And from there, I just continued doing sports. And then one day I saw the type of sports I wanted to get into, and it was college football recruiting. Uh, Rivals.com, Scout.com, most of those companies aren't around anymore. They've morphed into, uh, morphed into other things. But I got my started in athletics, and um, I was always intrigued because I was a jock myself. So it was always interesting to, you know, write a story about a game you were in 
kind of weird. And of course you can't, <laughs> can't mention yourself too much if you're writing it, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was good times. And, and I, that with me having a connection to athletics that really did kind of hone me in to want me to go deeper because I'm speaking their language. And, you know, I always say I was, I was born in locker rooms and, so that really leveraged me into my first book that left me in my, to my first uh, major job when I went national with uh, scout.com and Fox Sports Southwest. And it, it, it led me to a place where I wanted to know so much more than just the touchdowns and the, and the, and the field goals and the, and the catches and the tackles. I wanted to know more about athletes. So I, I really went on a deep dive to understand, you know, what was the mindset behind it? Because obviously I didn't know the mindset behind it when I was doing it. I just was, I was just playing ball, but I, I realized over time, uh, like I said, much like Napoleon Hill did with Think and Grow Rich, I wanted to know what was behind the athlete who was doing the great and amazing things on the field and on the courts. And I mean, there's so much that comes with being an athlete, right? Like, I mean, I am not one, <laughs> but from what I see, like just like the pressure, the goal setting, like just so many things. And that, that doesn't need to even be at a professional level, right? That can be in grade school. We have four kids and they all love sports and, you know, all that. Even like our son the other day, he um, ordered a book on Amazon. It's like, do you remember the title? It's It was like uh, dealing with mental health as an athlete and how to protect your mental health as an athlete, right? Because that's such a big component there. Yeah. I think it's called becoming a winner. Okay. Could be wrong though. Yeah. But just like all those different avenues. So being the athlete and then writing about that, that would have been uh, quite interesting. Well, you know, waking the baller within was really birthed out of, and I had, I, I realized this the other day, um, that every book I've written has been out of tragedy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, it, it led me when awaken the baller within was, written at a time when, you know, I was living the American dream. You know, I bought my first house at 29 without any outside help. Uh, had, a, had a job and a, had a side hustle that was paying me like half of what my actual job was paying. So I'm, I'm living what should have been the greatest life. And then, you know, somewhere along the way, um, I was like, you know, it's time to, to grow up and, you know, go ahead and get a relationship started. That would be, that would be ideal. And, and it was going well for about eight months. And then out of nowhere, the plug just got pulled on it literally three weeks after I bought my house. So the house I'm sitting in right now was like ground zero for the biggest meltdown I ever had. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and I'm just like, for a week, I was just a mess. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. And then I remember somewhere along the way, I sat down and I had a conversation with God. And I was like, you know what? Life is not too awesome right now. And I don't know what you want me to do, but I'm kind of lost right now. I'll tell you what, if you wake me up tomorrow, I'll figure some things out and we'll make some new moves. And of course, out of that, um, I did wake up while I'm still here and uh, I hired a mentor. And, you know, I started getting into personal and spiritual development, you know, started reading the Bible more, started reading Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I was reading Richest Man in Babylon, all the books it took to get you, you know, like to start seeing life in a, in a much greater scope. And so I'm like, OK, I have this newfound spiritual and personal development. But I'm in, but I'm in sports. I'm a jock. How do I merge the two? And awaken the baller within was birthed out of that. And so I went on a mission to interview a ton of athletes. You know, guys who you know were coming out of going into college, coming out of college, going into the pros. And I'm like, hey, and I, I did. You know, I had a series of questions to try to figure out what was the common denominator, just like Napoleon Hill did with Think and Grow Rich. And I came up with a whole philosophy out of that. And it ended up that book started being labeled as the Athlete's Life Manual because. What you find out is, is that sports is really just a metaphor for life. So mm -hmm. your son picking up a book that's talking about mental health. Well, playing sports is helping his mental health. That's what that's what it does, because sports teaches you things that life just you may miss. You know, you have teamwork, you have discipline, you have accountability, mm -hmm. you know, you have the trade off. Right. You don't you know, when it's two days, you don't you don't have time to go hang out with the guys and do crazy things because you're exhausted. All you want is food and sleep and water. <laughs> and so all of those things teach you so much um, for life. And so I wanted to, to try to put together something that would help athletes do what they do at a greater at a greater level. Because if I'm interviewing one of us and saying, hey, this is what the best of the best are doing. You can emulate this, too. 
Because a lot of times, you know, you'll find some guys who aren't really that talented. They're not really that talented, but they end up making it to the NFL. They end up making it to the NBA. And then you find guys who are just raw talented. And next thing you know, two years into college and they flunked out and you don't know where they are. Like I have, I have lists of recruits going all the way back to like 2005. And I'm like, man, where is this guy? This was one of the best and fastest guys I've ever saw. But when the mind is not there, you know, I call them talented casualties. The, the, mm. the, the streets are littered with guys who are better than the guys we see on TV right now. You know, I know we look at guys like Steph Curry, LeBron James, um, you know, you look at Jalen Ramsey and, uh, and all of the Cam Newton and these guys. For every Cam Newton, there's 100 dudes who are just as big and just as talented who just didn't make it. And I got to see these guys in real time. The biggest guy I ever saw, he was 6'8", 325 pounds. He got drafted like late in football, and I think he flailed out like three years in. You would think with those intangibles and being literally the number one athlete in his class, he should have been something. I don't know what went wrong, but I can guarantee you it probably has something to do with his mindset. Or Mm -hmm. he got caught up in the idea that there's so many press clippings about him that maybe he lost the edge to want to go out and get get better, right? All of those things are factors. And I was able to to piece through all of that. And the interesting thing is, is all of the guys I interviewed for Awaken the Baller Within, I think one or two of them are still playing football. The rest of them are done playing football and are extremely successful. One owns a waste management company. My other guy has a construction company out in Austin, Texas. Another guy is a, a college football coach. Another one is running successful companies. Another one is an actor who just moved from uh, moved from Hollywood and moved back to Texas and doing commercials, about to start a new film. Another one is, is an, he's 23 years old. He's an engineer making almost 100 grand, right? So the mindset it took to be successful on the field, these guys know how to use it somewhere else because success leaves clues. And it carries mm-hmm. over into other parts of life. And so the fact that you have, you know, your kids in, in sports, keep them there. Even if regardless of where they go, if they end up getting a scholarship or not, there's lessons that they're going to learn from sports that the two of you combined cannot teach them on your own. And that's mm-hmm. just the absolute truth, because when you're sitting there faced with a loss, you can't you can't manufacture a loss within the house. That can only be learned on the field of play, and especially for a young man. That absolutely is part of their development. You can't teach that. You can't teach what a loss feels like. They have to absorb that. And that, because it doesn't feel good, does something to us and say, you know what? I don't like this feeling. So when I go back into the lab, when I go back into the weight room, when I hit the field, I hit the court, I hit the swimming pool, I hit the tennis courts, whatever the sport is, I'm going to go at it with a new energy because I want to be better than I was yesterday when I hit my new comp- my new competitive uh, game that I'm going to be faced with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's interesting too, because it all like I, everything you just said, we are firm believers in when it comes to sports, right? And I uh, couldn't agree more. But also, just for goal setting for kids, like as parents, we can have that conversation. What are your goals? What do you want to do? But we can't implement that. That's up to them, right? So, when it comes to setting goals for how much you want to train, how much you want to do, if they take that, on and you know execute that however they want to do that that's when you're going to see change right and then you add in okay so here are your goals for the sport that you're playing what are your goals for school what would you like to add there to see the change because again as parents we could say you got to study more if they don't want to study especially when they get a certain age how like what are we going to do pull them in and sit them down at the desk right so it's all all of those things like I said, couldn't agree more in regards to what sports um, does and how you can bring that into your everyday life. Absolutely. And you, and you say, you know, I want you to study more. Well, studying more can be five minutes. <laughs> it's more than what you more than what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, 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 and the idea is like, you know, I, I want to be stronger. How much stronger? How much do you want your bench to go up? You know, I want to be faster. How much faster? I was right. jokingly say when I when I do some of my uh, some of my keynotes and people say you know man I want more money do you know how much no I just want more money and I flick them a penny <laughs> that's more money than you had right I'm, I'm 
you didn't specify how much you want. I, I could have had $500 in my pocket. You didn't ask for $500. You asked for more money, but you didn't define what that is. And right. so sports will, sports will help with all of that. And like you said, you know, you have your, your sports goals, you know, you have your football goals, you have your school goals. It, it's funny. Cause like, you know, my mentor, you know, taught me how to break down life in seven areas, physical, spiritual, mental, financial, social, business, mental, and family. Like there's goals for all of those. And it's like, what do you want in all of those? Make it clearly defined. Put a timetable to it. You know, if you say, hey, I want $100. Do you want to make $100 over the next 10 years or the next three months? Right. You, you, it's got to be a defined thing. And 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 having your, your, your kids make goals early on is so important because, man, there's a lot of there's a lot of young adults who don't understand the concept of goal setting in their mm-hmm. in their thirties. And they're like, I don't know what I want. And I'm like, well, we're a little behind the eight ball, but let's, uh, let's we can catch up. <laughs> let's pull the pin <laughs> pad out and start right now. Like, okay, first and foremost, where are we, <laughs> you know? And, and, and those, those are important things. And, you know, that can go into the school system. And once again, the fact that you all represent an intact home is important as well. Um, that cannot be stated enough. Um, because without what you all represent, the game of life in society cannot change until that is fixed because that's your first teacher. That's your first role model. That's your foundation. And when there is no foundation, everything is an outpicturing of the fact that you all are like, Hey, let's get together. Can I have this family meeting? What does everybody want? When any part of what you all are talking about is missing, there's a, there's a kink in the armor mm-hmm. and, we don't want to have that conversation. It's like, oh, you know, everybody's doing their best. Sometimes your best isn't good enough, right? right? And we need to, we need to, we need to stop trying to like take care of symptoms and take care of the cause on, on a whole nother level. And society needs a, a a total purging when it comes to that because a lot of people are like, hey, how do you fix this? Hey, man, if we don't, if we don't talk about fixing home, everything we're talking about is just going to just be spinning circles. Because if we don't have a team unit, just like it's like going, it's like going out, it's like going out and playing football without a quarterback, without a coach, without a general manager, without an athletic director. Can you operate as a team without all of those pieces? No. So why do we think the home can operate without having a family? And in a family as it was created to be, the family that built societies over so many, over so many years. So the mm-hmm. fact that you all have those conversations and you all are putting together structures so that your kids have the opportunity to win, that's extremely commendable, especially mm-hmm. today. So I applaud you all for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, I, I actually want to kind of circle back to uh, to the first book, Awaken the Baller Within. So uh, if I remember correctly, uh, you know, I did, I did a bit of research, but if I remember correctly, the... The, the the book and the content is actually being used by a, a number of colleges and being taught to the athletes. Uh, okay, I see you're nodding your head, so okay, I'm not getting my facts confused here, so that's good. <laughs> it, it 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 and obviously that uh, the book came out in 2011, and I did I did quite a bit of stops through camps and things of that nature. It, it's funny, like now that I'm um, now that I've written a new book, it's like it's it's so interesting. Awaken the bottle within intrigues a lot of people. It's just like oh my goodness, it's like. Yeah, it's like it's still in rotation, but not not spoken about. But I, I am seeing that it is something that I need to bring back to the forefront. Um, I'm in the process of considering writing a remix for it because uh, I'm at a different place now. I was really, really, really broken at that time. I didn't know it at the time, but now I do. Uh, but I was going around to sports camps. There were some colleges because uh, I remember Awaken the Bottle Within was, is what got my speaking career launched. Because, you know, I, I'm a, again, I'm a writer. I didn't really speak. And my mentor was like, hey, you know, if you want to help a book sale, you know, you go speak. I was like, oh, is that what you do? OK, <laughs> cool. So I sold my first my first major sale was to um, to one of my coaches. Uh, his team bought 80 copies of the book. And I was like, I'll come speak to him, too. And I remember just going out there, you know, I put my blazer on, got my jeans. And I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I have no clue. I have no structure. I'm putting together just you know, PowerPoint bullet points and just, you know, screaming like I'm in a locker room. 
but it's all I knew at the time, you know, and, <laughs> and, but that ushered in, you know, what I am today. It's like, I needed the talk then that I don't know if it went well or not. I mean, they loved it. I mean, I think from a structural <laughs> standpoint, my speaker coach is just like, yeah, you're a little all over the place. <laughs> well, you know, but they say, hey, if you if if your audience is getting it, then that's a win. You know, you know, change some things up later. And so uh, that was that was a very that was a book that really put me in a place to where a I knew I could write a structured book, but also you know the marketing side of things and really understanding what it took to be able to build that book. It was a lot of research. I mean, you know, I have tape on top of tape on top of tape you know, meeting guys, you know, <laughs> in, in, in storage closets and locker rooms. And I think one of my guys who he plays for the Cincinnati Bengals right now, he and I interviewed, he brought his girlfriend, who's now his wife. We did the interview at a Jack in a box, right? <laughs> at the t- and so you go back and you see these things and, and you laugh about them. Cause you're like, what was I doing? But then when you talk about, you know, what it takes to awaken a baller. It's like, you think sometimes when you don't know, you're actually more gung-ho to do things. You know, it's like the more you learn, the more you're like, oh, let me be careful. When you don't know, you're just, you're just running and jumping into the deepest pool and like, oh man, do I even know how to swim? You know, and then you like figure it out along the way. And so I, I learned a lot from awaken a baller within. I learned, you know, that, there's a certain way those guys do things, you know, they have goals, right? They, they, they have dreams beyond the sport, right? They, the sport is what they are, but it's, it doesn't define them. They, they, you know, these guys are family men. These guys have businesses. They're doing all sorts of amazing things. And the thing that I've, I've, I've held on to more than anything is that they attack life with a relentless pursuit. And that part of it, I've taken into every other program that I have. That, that relentless pursuit, that burn the ships, give me liberty or give me death, that that idea that like, I will succeed at this at all costs and going into things with that type of attitude. I think that's what made it resonate with a lot of coaches and, and a lot of players. And and thank you all for reminding me. I may have to bring that book yep. back and wrote, bring that book back in rotation. It's like, hey, can we get a fresh printing of that book? Let's go ahead and just run that back. I'm grateful for that. Yeah, well, when you run that back, I, I coach uh, I coach basketball, so let me know, and uh, <laughs> we'll we'll add that to the curriculum. They already get homework, but we'll <laughs> we'll, well, we'll I enhance guess, that curriculum a little bit. Well, then we'll we'll make we'll make sure and uh and get get you get your guys laced up. You know, I, I was known as the ballers coach for a little while, so <laughs> let's go ahead and you know get get it started with you all, and let's let's get let's get the philosophy. Let's get the philosophy in Canada. It hasn't made it to Canada, so let's make let's make that happen. So there you write. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we... <laughs> yes, I'm absolutely writing this down. Books to Canada now. Stack. Let's get it going. Let's get it going. Uh, get those boxed up. So have my team box them up as we're speaking. Like, come on, let's do this. Oh, man. No, I was going to say, and on that note, it is a little bit off topic, but um, prior to starting this conversation um, for the episode here, we were talking about you had brought up participation trophies and I, it sounded like you have some thoughts about that. So I would love to hear your thoughts in regards to the ribbons, the trophies for all these little guys, like or little kids that get to go out and uh, try their hand at some of these sports. <laughs> <laughs> so she wants the interview to go off the rails. Like now that's the, the, the that's what you all want. You want you, we get, d- disrupt the every disrupt the podcast. <laughs> Participation trophies in a long list of things that need to go, that probably is at the top of the list. And see, I didn't know about participation trophies until my nephew, I think when he was like seven or eight years old, he was playing soccer. And my sister came up to me and said, you know, your nephew, he went hard in the soccer game. I was like, really? She's like, yeah, he got four goals. I'm like, oh, that's the man. I was like, well, what was the score? She's like, they didn't keep score. <laughs> You just yeah. told me he scored four goals. She's like, well, I was keeping up with it, but they didn't keep score. They let, you know, they, 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 they shake hands and, you know, they don't keep score. I was just like, get my nephew out of that league. <laughs> I said, I need him to know that they won and he's a stud, 
right? Like, like he needs to, he needs to know, like, I triumphed. I overtook a team. I am dominating. But when you don't keep score it and the other team who completely got demolished, they need to know they got demolished, right? You need, oh goodness. So <laughs> yes, participation trophies are, 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 are bad for society. Um, especially for young, for young boys, young boys development. We have to become, we, we, we're not, it's not, we are, it's not, we are, we become, and we become through trial and error. We become through losses. We become through falling out of trees, you know, playing with one another, you know, wrestling in the front yard, uh, kill the man with the ball, you know, doing the little punching each other's arm to see, you know, who can take it. I mean, these things are very barbaric, but for whatever reason, they've been around in society since the beginning of mankind and they work, you know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, we don't, we don't want to, con we don't want violence. It's like, how is a young man going to grow up to be a man who provides and protects for his family if he's never gotten into a fight, if he's never had to defend anything, if he's never had to be challenged, pushed to the edge, and tested in, in, in the waters that are that are deep and uncharted. So participation trophies um, stunt growth. Uh, it creates entitlement. It demolishes delayed gratification, which everyone needs. So if you're rewarded for failure, what does that cause? That causes you to go into your job, your first job, and demand like a salary of like a senior VP and you just got there. Because you think, oh, I deserve it. Why? Well, because I work hard. Working hard is not enough. Mm -hmm. What skills do you provide? What do you know? What do you bring to the table? And when you're giving out trophies to people who didn't put in the work, didn't come away with the win, the development of what it takes to win is removed. And when you remove the incentive structures for these, for these young guys, they grow up and then when it's time for them to, to be in a place where they're challenged, their values are challenged, their manhood is challenged, they're, they need to stand up for something. They have nothing to stand on because they haven't, they haven't gone into any battles, mentally, physically, or otherwise. Because every, everywhere along the way, it's like, oh, you're good just as you are. No, you're not. In fact, you're the exact opposite. You need to go in there. You need to go in the weight room and get your muscles together. You need to read more books and strengthen your mind. But when, but when you're just like, oh, you're just good and you're winning and it's just, it's, it's good. You, you no problems here. By the time they get young adults, they don't know how to pick up a broom and sweep a floor. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to put gas in their car. They don't know how to go out and push a lawnmower. They don't know how to do anything because they've just been coddled this whole time. And there's study after study. Jonathan Heist done a lot of this research. You know, coddling young dudes is so bad. It's completely bad. And then, shocker, when he gets older and then there's young ladies around and he's trying to court them, they're not going to be attracted to a dude. How? There's no, there, he, he defends nothing. He stands for nothing. He has no philosophy. He has no values because he hasn't done anything to develop them. All he knows is, 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 is coddling, you know, soft serve sports and trophies that he didn't deserve, that he didn't earn. And that just creates a whole economy of everything that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, don't worry. We, we pretty much agree with most of that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but at the same time, it's interesting because I get it. Not everybody's into sports and stuff like that. But what uh, triggered my mind there was like group assignments even. Right. So take the sports out of it. Like sometimes these group assignments and it's that same thing or something sometime when you're having to work in a group, whether at work or whatever, and you don't pull your weight, but you still get that same reward. So in case you're a family who's not into sports, like there's other ways to look at it here. You're still going to get that same mark even though you didn't put any research time into this assignment or the, um, the project that you were working on at work with your coworkers. Right. So it, that, that part, it is tricky. Yes. And, 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 it, but it's, and it's all based on the same mindset and, 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 and obviously we'll slightly go back into sports just a second. I, obviously when I tell people to put their kids in the sport, like 
some people just don't have it. You know, you know, two left feet, whatever you want to call it. It's just not very talented. But I, I tell them in those developmental years, you know, you'll sort of find what their sport is and maybe they're just not athletic. But keep them in there a little longer, right? Because even if you're not excelling at it, the camaraderie, the mm-hmm, locker room, absolutely, the practices, um, and, and what will end up happening? Because I've known a lot of guys. One of my one of my clients, he went to school, and I don't think he hardly ever saw the field. But what he was was he was a good ambassador. He was what you know what they call in sports a good locker room guy. You know he's mm-hmm. unifying. You know he's willing to do whatever for the team. Team goes out and does community service. He leads in that way. He's a he's a good guy to be just to just have and represent the team when you go out and do things in the community, do things in the school. He's representing the brand of whatever college or high school he's going to. Not to mention when they stay in that, maybe they like sports, but they just couldn't play. So now you start leveraging into, you know, uh, being part of sports medicine, being on the coaching staff, maybe as a a, a GA or a, a, an assistant coach. And last I checked, coaches are doing pretty well, uh, especially <laughs> when you start getting into the college level. And so sometimes keep them in the sport until they find something else, more so for the structure, mm-hmm. right? more than anything. Because th- the bottom line is, is if you take them out of sports, they still need something to do after school. And they exactly. still need to be in something where there's a clear winner and a clear loser. Like even if they're going into the spelling bee. I don't want participation <laughs> trophies in the spelling bee. You misspell a word, you're out. Go home. <laughs> you lost. Like I, we just have to get to the point where there's winners and losers. And I know people yep. are like, you know, everybody's a winner. <sighs> No, everybody's not a winner. Now you work to become one, but you don't just get Mm -hmm. to be one by default. And that's where the problems are. So yes, you might find out that they just don't have it in the sports, but leave them in there for the, leave them in there for the structure and, and maybe try some different sports out to see if there is a sport that'll work out for them. But extracurricular activities do need to be done either that or go get a job. Yeah, and, and you know what? Actually, going back to the uh, the sports piece, you know, even if they're not keeping score, the kids always know who won. Yeah, right. No, 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 no matter how much the adults try to intervene and say, "Yeah, we're not keeping score," the kids always know what the score is. Yeah, yeah. I heard somebody earlier saying, like, you know, uh, you know, they don't take score, and your team goes zero and ten, and at the end of the year, they throw you a pizza party, and it's like, for what? You don't deserve ice cream, right? You 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 come home and you have regular basic dinner, whatever we had. No set out, no extras. No, we're not going out to any theme park or anything like that. We're going to go back into the lab, and it's going to be business as usual. And that's what I think we need more of. We need more forged by fire type of situations because the game is getting so soft, and it's just like, you know, I got guys showing up to me, you know, 15, 16 years old, and you can just tell, like, man you have not gotten into any disputes of any kind. Like, like, and, and you can tell because just their interaction, they just, they're, they're, they tiptoe through life. And that's very dangerous once you start crossing in the teenage years, because, you know, once you go to college, Lord knows what's going to happen when you get into a place where you have some agency, you know, that can go a many a different ways. And I don't, I would want to go into that part of it on this podcast, but, Let's just say if there's 10 things that can go, that can happen, nine of them are bad. Right. They, they can go when you don't have the idea of, uh, of dealing with it, dealing with your emotions and adversity at a level to where you understand that losing is part of the process of development. And we're trying to take that out. And, and you, you just can't because those adversity is going to win out because everyone has to face adversity. And we can't engineer that out of life. It's impossible. So with that, would you say to parents listening that, um, you know, you were just saying about the kids and college and stuff like that, like just really making sure your child, one, knows how to advocate for themselves, uh, knows how to deal with conflict. And I don't know, those two just really came to mind. Would you say that those are some... um, Important uh, qualities. Yes, thank you. Important qualities that your child needs to know before going off to post-secondary, what, whatever it is that they're going to be doing. Absolutely. And obviously sports is one of those things. And I think really what it comes down to is 
you know, let's just say school is from eight to three. I don't know what the system is down there. Let's say grade school is from eight to three. You need something to teach you outside of school and outside of the home. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a job, an internship, uh, a trade, you need to do something outside of the school structure and home structure to where this is yours, to where you embody, to where there's, there's, there's a schedule, there's responsibility, there's accountability, there's teamwork. Uh, like I said, sports work in this situation, uh, a part-time job, um, going to be uh, an apprentice. You just need something to where you're answering to someone other than your mother, your father and mother, and who's an authority figure to where you learn how to take orders from authoritative sources outside of the home. Mm-hmm. Coaches, mentors, pastors, deacons, uh, CEOs, vice presidents of companies, um, you know, a foresman, like construction project managers. You just need multiple layers of development. So like you're talking about, you're talking about how you can deal with conflict. You deal with conflict by being in places where conflict is going to happen. If, if you're coddled, you don't know what conflict is. And the second conflict comes, your whole world is crashing, right? When you, when you see some of these, you know, we see on TV, it's like, you know, man, this guy had a total meltdown and you're looking over. It's just like, oh, another child actor who, who, who's, who, who's, you know, looking at life and has never been outside of this glass house, right? They, they've been so, you know, placed in so many different arenas that if anything outside of this structure that's been built around them happens, their whole world comes crashing down. And so we can take and learn a lesson from that and saying it like, hey, I'm going to put you somewhere on an island where you have some agency with some with some structures around you that's not one of us to where you learn to acquiesce. You learn to submit to someone else who is an authoritative figure. Because you think about like all of the crime that's going on, all of the tension between, you know, authoritative figures and and young people. It's like, where does that come from where you have so much disdain for authoritative figures? That's because your parents didn't put authoritative rules and mandates within the home so when you go out into the to the world you think that everyone is supposed to bend to you and the world doesn't operate like that there's authoritative figures out there who you're supposed to you know respect and adhere to but when you don't honor your father and mother you take that disdain from them out into the streets and that's where again the structure of everything comes together and they need to be able to deal with that conflict because if they don't deal with the conflict, the conflict will deal with them. And the conflict out there is not going to protect them. Mm-hmm. It's going to be whatever whatever way you want to push the envelope, it's going to get pushed back. And we've seen a lot of destruction happen with that. And it can turn out badly, almost to the point where somebody doesn't come home. Mm-hmm. And we don't want that. But we need structure in place to be able to to prevent those type of things from happening. Now, we, we've kind of uh, hinted towards it uh, during this conversation, but some of the work that you do, because you mentioned you, you made reference to like that 15 or 16 year old that comes to you and you realize, OK, they, they haven't really been through any adversity or they haven't really had to you know fight a battle for themselves. So can, can we talk about how everything that you've learned throughout your, your writing career and athletics and school? And how that ties into what you do today? That that has a, it really has morphed and evolved over time. Um, I've always worked with young people, like I said, mostly in sports, uh, some nonprofits as well. Recently, I, I expanded my young people because um, uh, one of my clients is the Boys and Girls Club, and I've always sort of been in that teenager, young adult phase. And then, you know, one of my clients ended up being the CEO of a boys and girls club branch down here. And she wanted me to bring, wanted to bring me on and bring my programs over there. And I'm just like, all right, you know, we're the teenagers. Let's get this going. And she was like, Oh, the contract is for K through (laughs) five. That's a big difference. Um, so my programs are for, you know, basically the floor is like 12 (laughs) and you're saying like a five-year-old and she's like, well, 
it's for K through five. And so I was just like, Jesus. And so I did put together programs that can help for as low as uh, K through five. Cause I say, you know what, if I can learn how, if I can teach values to a mm. five-year-old who doesn't live with me, I think I can teach anyone. And so we, I've been with them three and a half years now. So I think we're doing something right okay. and the kids love it. Um, but what I've learned is, is that um, kids, teens want, and I mean, want discipline. And as the kids will say, they want the smoke, right? They, they want, they want to be reprimanded. They want the discipline. They want you to lean in on them. They want you to look at them and say, this is not advantageous to your life. I'm disappointed in the results of what you did when you know better. And th there's something about the idea that there's, there's levels to this. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the teens I work with, you know, most of them have uh, families at home. Some don't. And I'm a, it's, it's, it's pretty much a mix. But whether they have a father at home and a mother or if they have one or the other, they all want discipline. And I think th this idea that, you know, the, the, the kids call it the YOLO, you know, you only live once, do what you want. Like they really don't want that. They want structure. They want to, 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 to they want some agency, but they want to know that like there's there's a system. There's a way we're going to do things. And this is what is expected of you. This whole do what you want. And I, and I know it goes back to the to the Woodstock live and let live. And like, oh, you know, everybody turns up and that. Yeah, that's that looks good on a bumper sticker. But in real life, that doesn't work. And I've seen over time that working with working with teens, they want discipline. They want they want the tough love. You know, people always say, you know, can, can you scale it back some? And I'm like, no. I'm not going to scale it back because life is not fair and life is not easy. Um, and if you treat people on the level of, well, you know, it'll be okay or whatever. It's like your first employer doesn't care that something happened at your house that was not cool. You know, that, like they don't care that, you know, your 13 year old gave you a dirty look and stormed out of the house. They don't care. Are you going to come here and do your job? And so I want to get youngsters to the place where, because I, I, I scale everything up. If you're 15 year old, years old, I'm going to train you as an 18 year old. If you're 18, I'm going to train you at the 22 year old level. If you're 12 years old, I'm going to bump you up to 15 because I want you to grow into the situation. I still understand that you're going to make mistakes because you're 12 and I'm giving you 15 year old knowledge, but I want you to be able to stretch. I want you to be challenged. I want you to, I want your head to, to expand some. And so almost to the point where you get a headache, because I know that with the fact of the information age being where it is, see, they didn't come up the way I did. I, I say, you know, we had to work for information. We had to go into the library and, and go through the Dewey Decimal System and write on the, with those little short pencils and take down all the stuff and go in and get the books and read them to put together a paper. We couldn't ask Siri and Alexa for information. <laughs> you know, there was no internet. There was libraries and you had to go get seven books and put together a term paper that was three or four pages long. That, that attitude of everything coming to you quickly is the reason why we have some of those issues we were talking about with the trophies. Mm -hmm. We had to work to go get information. They just speak into this and get whatever they want immediately. They have Amazon two-day shipping. I always joke, my brother, I have a brother who's 32 and one who's 30. I said, I said, you want to know how we had to order stuff back in the day? You had to go get a magazine, <laughs> tear that little piece out, write down the address, write a check, mail it to them. They got it and then sent you your product back six to eight weeks later. It took, <laughs> you would forget you ordered something back in the day before it came in. You do snap your fingers in and a package is on your doorstep. <laughs> and whereas that's awesome and technology came together, but what, look what it created. It created this microwave type of mindset. And so I am the one who comes in as your podcast. I come in and disrupt the idea that the game is going to come to you easily and quickly. Like I'm telling you to take the long way to do this, right? I the one who will tell you like, hey, go grab a push mower. I don't want you sitting down. 
go instead of doing the electric hedges, I want you to get the old school and, and, and cut the hedges that way, right? I want calluses on your hands, right? I want you to understand the trade-off of working and that's been lost. And luckily, thankfully, I had old school fathers who gave me the old school game, right? I used to always jokingly say, my dad, before I started playing sports, my dad used to just walk in my room at like seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and just <laughs> knock on the door and tell me to get up. <laughs> Why? Who knows? He said, hey, come in here and follow me. Come in here and follow me to the garage. And after a while, I realized he's thinking about what he wants me to do in the garage while he's walking because he didn't have a plan together. <laughs> but, but what it was is, is you're not going to be a young man in my house sleeping in on a Saturday. You're going to get up and work. Why? Because I feed you, because I house you and clothe you. So I'm trying to implement my own way of bringing the old school back into the new school microwave society. It's tough in working with the young people, but I hey, I, you know, I, I still have my youthfulness to me, even though I'm in my 40s. And so they know they're not going to outlast me. And I'm going to continue pressing them and leading them to a way that's going to make them more productive so that they can be a, an asset to society and not a drain. Mm -hmm. I want you to be useful. I want you to go provide service to others that's needed and necessary. I don't want you to go get a useless degree that just looks cute on the wall, but has no market value, right? I want you to go out and do something that we ask for. Go provide a service to the greatest number of people and get the corresponding wealth that comes with that. That's the way I try to bring up my, my youngsters in that way. Now, the one thing you mentioned, obviously, was uh, in there was your father and the uh, the impact that he had. Now, do you, do you find when you're talking to a lot of these these children and, and young adults that the ones who have those struggles maybe don't have somebody fulfilling that role in their life? Is that kind of a common theme that you see? It's it's fifty fifty at this point, and it, and it really depends on where I am, certain neighborhoods, you're going to see a whole lot of that certain neighborhoods, right. you know, it's, it's sprinkled. But what I'm, what I am finding out is, is that, um, it's very complicated, uh, in the sense that even the young men I work with who have fathers, I talk with their fathers and their fathers are like, lean in as much as you want. Right. Because what's happening now and, and something I, I think I just came up with this a couple of months ago. Um, I want you to have a counselor, and, and this goes for the ladies too. I want you to have a counselor around you, a minimum of three people, right? Who pour into you, who mentor with you, right? If you're 15 years old, you need someone in their late twenties. You need someone in their mid thirties. And then you, or maybe in your forties. And then you need that elder statesman, 50, 60 years old, you know, the old school patriarch, you know, you know, the one, you know, everyone shows up and, you know, comes in and, and wants advice from from the, from the from a sage from an old school guy who's lived life done great things have built things and so i'm encouraging them even as young as teenagers to put a council around them um i i've put together a, a board of of my choosing um and you know at this time i say this sadly that uh i lost my speaker coach uh about two weeks ago uh, very devastating blow. He was part of my, my council of three people who these three individuals can help me do any level of business across the world. They all represented something different. Well, I thought, well, wh why not teach the youngsters to a lead, get you a leader at every level of life so that you have wisdom that goes beyond where it's going. And so so yes, I work with a lot of young men and some of them do have fathers and their fathers are like, hey, lean in, press in, uh, you know, reprimand them, right? Because they understand that like, it's just not enough, right? And even you all, you have your sons in sports. You know that the coach is an authoritative figure. And when your kids are in their world, that that is the leader of that group. You listen to what he has to say. And so- I, I want to make sure that these young men, because 
we've gotten to this point where you think that you're supposed to do life alone, that you don't need community. We've totally removed that because once we broke the family part, then it was just like, oh, you don't need anybody. And, you know, some people become successful and say, you know, I did this all on my own. And it's just like, why are you lying to people? <laughs> like no one does life alone. No one becomes successful alone. And so I want them early on to know that not only is there someone in your corner for you, but you should always keep multiple people in their corner. And the way I teach, the way I teach them is like, hey, you know, if my guys come up to me, my, I mean, these youngsters are, are pretty intelligent. They'll come up to me and ask me some questions. And I'm just like, um, I don't know. But give me 48 hours and I'll go, I'll go find somebody who does. Right. I don't I don't I don't lie to them and think and think that I know everything because I don't. And so I, I I encourage them to to seek out information. And if I don't know it, I will go find the resources needed to be able to come get that to you. Because as your leader, it's 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 on me to make sure you get the proper information. And it's not up to me to try to just fill a gap and say and just try to come up with something. If I don't know, if I don't know, have some humility and say you don't know. And 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 I and I, I love that role with them because I do sort of play an uncle second, third father role for a lot of them. And, you know, I've been, I've been in prayer a lot about this lately. Um, just, you know, create in me, my mind, my heart, my actions, create me who I need for them, creating me who I need to create in me the man I need when I was 17 years old, whatever that looks like, what do I need to get rid of to be able to be what I need to help your generation do better at life over here? So where do you want me to serve in that capacity? What do I need to become to be there? And so I've really leaned in on that a lot lately. Um, that's not an easy process that I'm finding out very quickly. Um, because when you really lean into mentorship, it it forces you to grow in areas you might not have thought of. Because, you know, if we're thinking about it from, you know, a God to man perspective, he's got to prepare you for a battle that maybe you haven't faced before. A young man may come up to you with a situation that you're unfamiliar with. So whatever's blocking you from becoming that, we need to get rid of that. And so been a lot of stirring, a lot of work going on, but I, I'm here for it because the young men who whom I work with and those who I haven't met yet are worth it. And, and, and I, I'd be hard pressed to say that, that that's part of my life calling. And so whatever I need to be for them, then let's go and let's make it happen. Awesome. Now I want to transition actually to 2020 when you wrote your most recent book, Now What? <laughs> Can we talk about that process and kind of what contributed to that? Well, I mean, maybe you all were around for 2020. Or a few <laughs> things that, maybe a few things that happened in society all over the place, maybe where you are, where I was. And there was so much conversation. There was so much tension. There was so much everything, information going all over the place. And I remember I was on a, I was on a tollway out here and I was just, I was listening to some podcasts and all these consenting ideas. Cause I, I, I try to listen to a vast number of things and, and just kind of put it all in a pot and sift out what I need from it. And I remember just like, man, enough, man, I pulled out a notepad and I wrote the outline for now what on the highway. I know you're not supposed to drive and, and write, um, <laughs> you know, might be telling on myself, but I mean, when you're a writer, your ideas come at, in the craziest times. And so I wrote the outline for now what at that time. And what it really stemmed from is not only a conversation with my birth father, but it also came from a profile from a guy I went to high school with. I was sitting down with him and I was listening to what he had going on. And it was so much. And, you know, me as a coach, I'm trying to sift through how to help someone. And so it's like, all right, four kids from three different ladies. X, Y, you, your wife is about to leave you. You have three felonies. 
um, you're on the verge of getting locked up again. The thing you need is a lawyer, but you can't get the resources needed to be able to do the jobs you need to afford a lawyer because your wife took all of your equipment. And so I'm saying, so the only thing you could do is go back to selling drugs. So I'm like, how do you help someone in that scenario? And so now what was created from that, because, because I had to go through a step, step-by-step -step process and say, okay, if the worst case scenario was going on, what do we do? And so the five steps to creating the most out of life, the first thing is you have to do is reflect. Like you're standing in a pile of rubble. There's a dirty, there's some dirty clothes over there. The trash can's kicked over. There's a rat running across your living room and you're just like, this is a mess. So what all do we have here? You know, and how did we get here? You need to reflect on the idea of what was the actions taken for you to end up in this, what the kids would call a hot mess over here, <laughs> you know? And so you, you have that heart to heart. You take personal inventory, like, okay. And, and I, I always, I always ask people when they're in a, like a bad spot, I always ask, when was the last time you experienced a win? Like when life was good. And, and for some people, it, they got to go like way back. But we want to identify how we got here. So that's reflect. And of course, then once you decide, once you reflect on how you got there, then you have to decide. This is a mess. Now decide, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What, what degree do you want to pursue? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to change careers? Do you want to start a family? What does that look like? Okay, now we decide. And then part three is you go into the planning phase. It's when you make your mind maps, you put together your business plan, you write down your goals and say, okay, I want to become a mechanic. Okay, let's work in reverse. How do you do this? Do I need schooling? Okay, if I do need schooling, how much does it cost? Do they have financial aid available, right? Who's who's the best mechanic out here who I can be an apprentice for? All of these little, how you need to work through these things. And then of course, you know, you go into your action phase. You may not be ready. Well, I don't have everything figured out. You'll never have everything all figured out. Go out there, run into some roadblocks and just make it happen. And so, and the action stage were really intentional and the mistakes are going to be made and you allow that. And again, just like the growth from football, sports, you know, the teams at the, at the job or whatever, it all is part of the process. You're going to fail. You're going to fail multiple times. Get up, clean yourself up and get back to work. And then, of course, the last step in the five steps is to seek. And it's called seeking counsel. Again, we talk about that community, getting you an accountability ally, right, getting you a mentor getting you somebody who's going to help you spiritually and mentally, getting someone who's going to help you with strategy and business, getting someone who's going to be your moral compass. Like, hey, that's not a good idea to do that. Why? Because it's just not the right thing to do. I remember one time my mentor told me that one time. I was just like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to go between this and this. And he's like, well, that right there that's not an ideal thing to do. And I'm like, well, what's, what's going on with it? It just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Fair enough. And so you walk away from that because a wise man says you should walk away from that. And you know what? You probably should listen to him. And so that's where the seeking counsel comes in. You build a community, you build a board, and you build people around you who are going to help empower you, who are going to pour into you and give you what you need to be able to be a better man, a better young lady. And so we can get to a place where we can start earning and being a certain, being a member, a serviceable member of society and help doing some great and amazing things. Excellent. Now, Ahmad, before we wrap up today, uh, can you just tell us what we can look forward to from you in the future? I know uh, I'm sure there's probably another book somewhere in, in the future, <laughs> but, but what, what are, what are you working on these days? So right now, um, um, working with us, working with a speakers bureau, uh, right now, um, I to start getting on, on the road and, and, and speaking again in person because uh, what I was doing with the Boys and Girls Club, I was making a lot of curriculum and I'm actually about to have another meeting with them and go back to my young people. But I think they're actually going to put together a council of, uh, of young men to where I teach uh, some etiquette courses to them. So I'm creating some material that's going to be specifically for young men and young adults. Um, it's going to do a lot of work with that. The ministry work will still be going on. Going to hit a got a mission trip coming up this summer. I'm looking forward to that. Um, leaning in on that because uh, the more I've leaned into the ministry, the more it's helped 
shaped me in my business, uh, my business world as well. So uh, obviously promoting the book now, what is going to be a lot of that going on um, and just really getting back on the road and, and really leaning in on on the young people. I, I think that that's a demographic I want to lean in on. Of course, I do do things with small businesses, corporations and with managers all across the country. Um, but our future's back there. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've been told many times, like, you know, that's a fickle group to deal with. You know, you can't be successful working with them or whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I feel like if I'm pouring into the future, I feel like there'll be favor. I'll be blessed in ways that I haven't even thought of. Mm-hmm. And I'm confident in knowing that I'm grateful for where God has brought me to at this point. And if I lean in on a calling that he's placed on my life, I can't go wrong. And so you'll see a lot of things. You'll probably start, you know, seeing me move around a little bit more with the book. You, uh, More curriculum will be coming. I'd like to start a course with that as well and really just use that as a resource to be able to help um, help people who are trying to make those types of transitions in life. And I think that that's going to be very important um, as we see how much angst and how much entitlement is in, is in the world. And I want to get people back to where we're providing useful service to one another. No, absolutely. And now just so everybody as well knows how to follow you, how to, how to get in touch. Uh, it is consistent branding across. So it's, it's simply uh, a mod Vital and I'll spell that out for those who are listening. It's if you're on IG or Twitter, it's at a H M a R D. So there's a silent D there. V I T A L. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, also going to be the same thing for the website, uh, amadvital.com. And of course, uh, if you do want to get a copy of the book, now what it's just, again, just what I said there, book now what.com. So uh, Amad's made things, uh, Amad's made everything nice and easy for, uh, for us to, to, again, just to be on top of the work that he's doing. Well, I'm a former jock. We got to keep things simple. Um, <laughs> just, just a jock who's read a few more books. You know, um, but it but it works. You know, I never never come off as you know an intellectual college professor type. Though I've spoken to college professors as as a jock, so I, I just want I just want to be a resource um, to be able to help people just do better at li- and just you know live a better life. You know, be better for their families, be able to earn more and provide more for not only their families but for their communities. Um, we need that. Uh, we're bereft of that at the moment. Um, there's so many people in their silos and in their holes or whatever. I want people to get out and, you know, do something good for your next door neighbor. Mm-hmm. You know, buy somebody a cup of coffee who you don't know. Right. Just send someone a thank you note. Thank you card out of nowhere. And just tell them how reach out to people who made an impact in your life and tell them how much they mean to you. You know, all of these things that are just gratitude. Right. When service and gratitude is the foundation of your life, life will change for you. Instead of thinking about what can I get out of this, it's whom can I serve? Mm-hmm. We got to change our language with this thing. Because once you change the, change your mindset, you change the language. And once we get to that point, I think we can do we can do a little bit better uh, with a many of things. And I think we get started on a new path. And, you know, with podcasts like this one, I think we can start showing people that there's a better way to live. A, and there's a better way to to be in our homes and in our communities. Mm-hmm. And I wrote down the question that you asked. Um, when was the last time you experienced a win? And I think, you know, for anybody listening, like just be encouraged that, you know, if it was a hard day, a hard start to the week or just a tough parenting season and, you know, you're needing to encourage one of your children or even yourself, like just sitting back and asking yourself that question. Like, yeah, things could be really bad right now, but things have been really good too, right? So I, I like that. I wrote it down. I think that's... uh good reminder for all of us definitely and you can add what's good here too Mm -hmm. that's a that's another one that's a that's a that's a exercise that's in the book uh when the world is crashing down around you you look at that adversity square in the face and say what's good here now sometimes you might be like there is not much (laughs) to be a little tricky (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. to figure out. well well it was created it was created from like an extreme tragedy that was the night after my you know when my father died and i was about i was like how is my father dying the greatest moment in my life 
And it took me a long time to come to those answers, a lot of tears, a lot of just tearing my mind and heart apart. But I realized you don't see the guy in front of you without my father dying tonight after my 33rd birthday. Uh, my divorce. How's anything good out of that? Money's gone. House is torn apart. You're displaced from your place. Why is this the greatest moment in my life? What's good here? It taught me how to serve at a greater clip. It taught me how to give back when the money that you're used to having is not there. So you go serve more, which seems like, wait a minute, you're going to go give more at a time when you don't have as much as you did before? Yeah, I doubled up on my service. And that same year, I doubled the amount of speaking engagements I had. How does that happen? It's bigger than me. (laughs) But you embrace those kind of things. The what's good here, um, for those who go check that out and go in that chapter, um, the what's good here um, exercise is uh, is powerful. It's it, it'll 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 bring things out of you uh, at another level, and, and it help you deal with any strife you have with an ex, with your parents, uh, with an employer you have some issues with, wherever the. Wherever the stressor is coming from, the what's good here will bring you out. Like you just said, you know, kids are having a bad season with your kids or whatever. It's like, yeah, what's good here? He's my son and I love him. He's just going through something right now because you don't know where his pain point is. Have we sat down and asked him why he's acting out? There's always a reason and a mindset behind it. And when we get out of the idea that it's not about us, then you can get to the bottom of some some answers. And so the where's the win and what's good here are, are two questions that you can ask on a daily basis as tragedies happen. And um, it'll just help put things in perspective to where you're grateful for the fact that you came out of it alive and you're grateful for the fact that you can be blessed with answers to be able to be in a solution state of mind as opposed to just thinking it like, oh, well, you know, Life is just terrible. Oh, you know, woe is me. It's like, it it always could be worse. And I know that's cliche, but it's true. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, we could have kept my father on life support longer. And I chose, and we, and my mother came to me and we chose not to. I said, I said, my dad doesn't, my dad's not a man who, who wants to live on a machine. I said, take him off the plug and let him fight. And then we'll just, we'll live with the results. And he fought for four hours. Why is that not a win? My, my dad's on this, he's on the ropes. And we pulled him off the machine and he fought for four more hours before he left this earth. Man, the resiliency of my dad in that moment, how's that not a win? How's that not an example of like, man, my father is one bad dude. And I saw it from that standpoint, you know, and it was, it wasn't easy to see that, but it was like, it was so much that was learned from that. And I just want people to get that part of life that everything is here for the good of you, right? That's biblical and that and that's been proven to be right. There's something good in everything. To find it is not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. And there's going to be some days that are rough. But remember, life is not all about it being happy, but being fulfilling, Mm-hmm. And I want people to to get that, and that'll hit someone later. And I hope it does. Absolutely, that was some some great words of wisdom there. Well, Ahmad, I just want to thank you for taking the time to join us tonight, mm-hmm. and uh, again, just share, you know, everything that you've learned, and and you know, and and I know it's going to be impactful for uh, for the folks who who listen to or watch this this episode of this podcast. I thank you all for having me. Uh, it, it's been a ble- it's been a blessing being on with you all. Um, I never take for granted uh, when I run into uh, people like yourselves um, who represent what I think the world needs. You know, loving parents, holding things down, holding holding your kids accountable. Um, I wish that was common. It's just not. And so seeing you all gives me a little bit more juice when I wake up in the morning and say, you know what? You still have some people out there fighting a good fight. You're not alone. So I thank you all for that. Thank you. It's a work every day. (laughs) Lots of mistakes along the way, but 
We're in it. <laughs> go, go kill a bear every day. You know, we're hunters and hunter gatherers, you know, and have refrigerators back in the day. You had, to go get fresh, you had to go get fresh food every day, every day. So you all keep fighting a good fight. Keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone who watched or listened to this episode of the podcast, thank you for letting us disrupt your every day. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.